Welcome back, folks, to episode 198 of Hashtag Ask GSM here today for September 13th, 2017. I'm Graham GSM Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well. And you heard that right, episode 198 here today, 198 episodes of this very show dating back to July of 2013, been over four years, which also means that we are quickly approaching. That has never been more true than it is today. Episode 200, which you're coming up on in merely two weeks on September 27th, that Wednesday. So um, I've talked about it quite a bit in the past two months or so, what we would be doing for that show. And it seems like I've got down the formula for what we would be doing. The plan is set in stone for that Wednesday. I'm excited to officially announce right now that on that Wednesday around 12 o'clock noon Eastern time, we will be going live, not only for the first time in hashtag AskGSM history, but in the history of this entire YouTube channel. Now, I've been on YouTube now for over eight and a half years. I've had this channel going since March of 2009. For the first time ever, I'll be doing a live stream for hashtag AskGSM, which I thought would be cool. So... I'm going to try to call a few people up, Jason, RJ, maybe a few others. Uh, you can send in your questions, obviously, ahead of time, which I encourage you to start doing now. Um, I know some people did it a while ago. I'm not sure if I documented it or not. I probably didn't, so I apologize. But start now. Start sending me your questions, not only for next week, but for episode 200. So if you want a big, epic question answered like we've talked about before, like there have been times where you guys send in questions that are just way too elaborate for me to answer in one episode or... Uh, for me to answer in the in the course of 24 hours since you sent in your question. If you want to start doing that stuff, do it for episode 200. Again, coming up in two weeks. Whether you're around or not, you can check it up. You can check it out after the fact, obviously. I'm not sure what I'm doing that afternoon, which is why I'm not doing the live stream later. Uh, like, Wednesday nights are kind of busy for me. So, during the day, it seems like it would be the best time to do it. So, again, at noon Eastern time, right here on the channel. Now, I scheduled the event... I'm not sure if it shows up on the channel or if you guys got a notification or what the deal is. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to play out, but I will share the link to the video. And I tried out the technology, the software last night, because again, I've never done this before. So I'm going to, you're going to help me out as we go along. Um, I tried the live stream last night. I think I got it to work and I'm not going to do anything fancy and playing music and all this other shit. I'm just literally going to have my camera, my microphone and we're going to go to town. That that's all we're going to do, just play it basic. I don't want to fuck anything up and it might take me a bit longer to get everything set up, but that's the whole purpose of doing it live, baby. We're going to do it live. So again, 2 weeks from now, if you want to start sending your questions for that epic episode, that epic episode, that epic milestone show, uh please start doing so right now by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at @wrestlerant with the hashtag Ask GSM with all the, uh, also 200 at the end of it. Hashtag Ask GSM 200. You can do the same thing on Facebook at facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Leave a comment on the post I usually put up on Tuesday nights, not if not on the wall itself. And last but not least, be sure to drop a comment down below on this very video. I'll be sure to include your question in next week's edition. And again, if you want to include it for the 200 episode instead, I mean, obviously send in questions for next week. We're not skipping over next Wednesday. I don't want 199 to be a complete afterthought. But if you want a question answered for episode 200, just let me know. Uh, include it in the comment that I want this for episode 200. And I'll be sure to include it. So we'll have a live chat going. If you guys want to send in questions as I'm doing the video, we can do that too. There's a lot of different options. I'll have other people answer questions. Like I said, maybe RJ, Jason, a few others. Um, a lot of guests from hashtag AskJSM's past. So more on that as it approaches in two more weeks. But I've spent enough time talking about episode 200. Let's talk about episode 198 here today. First question comes from AP450 on YouTube. Amanda, her question was, with Andre Cien Adamas, Challenging Drew McIntyre for the NXT Championship at recent New York, Ontario house shows. Do you see them having another match at TakeOver? I could see that being the case. I don't know. It, it doesn't look like they're going in that direction. I would guess they're doing Drew McIntyre and Adam Cole. Based off what we saw at the end of the last TakeOver and what they've been teasing recently on TV. Either Drew McIntyre and Adam Cole or Drew McIntyre and Roderick Strong. Another match that was teased on the post-TakeOver episode of NXT a few weeks back. Or a triple threat. I don't know where a CN factors into all of that right now. He really just started winning matches again and beating Johnny Gargano at TakeOver. I would wait to do that match until later on, a little later on down the road. I did say after TakeOver Brooklyn 3 that it would make the most sense. I don't know what the status is of uh, of Candice LeRae, whether she's been signed or not, but I would love to see her sign. I know she popped up last night 
in the uh, in the crowd during the Mae Young Classic Finals. But bringing her in to team with obviously her husband Johnny Gargano makes the most sense after Zelena Vega got, excuse me Zelena Vega got involved in the last match between Almas and Gargano a takeover. You do Gargano and Almas again a takeover uh, in. Where is it? Dallas, I think. Dallas again, or I'm not exactly sure. Houston, I'm not, I don't know. But um, you do that match again at the Survivor Series weekend show. I think it is Houston. But it's a mixed tag team match. You have Candice LeRae and Johnny Gargano, Mr. and Mrs. Wrestling, versus Almas and Zelena Vega, who can go. Rosita is a wrestler. I know she's currently a manager, but she is a wrestler too, so it doesn't, you know isn't completely out of the ordinary to think, you know, completely unfathomable to think that she can't wrestle a match in NXT. So, no, I don't think McIntyre and Almas is the direction they're going in right now. Um, I mean, there's still plenty of time before the takeover. There's over two months. So they could always set it up. They could do it on TV. They could do it at takeover. But for, from what it looks like right now, they are going to be doing McIntyre and Strong or McIntyre and, and Cole, which makes more sense right now. And I would love to see them continue that feud between Almas and Gargano by incorporating Vega and Larey as well. Emmanuel A. from YouTube, his question was, I played, I played a bit of WWE 2K17 recently in anticipation for 2K18 next month. I ended up generating a particular, par, a peculiar, excuse me, WrestleMania match card in universe mode that had the following seven matches. Hideo Itami vs. Samoa Joe for the Intercontinental Championship. Enzo Amore and Big Cass versus the New Age Outlaws. Stephanie McMahon versus Asuka for the Women's Championship. Brock Lesnar versus Finn Balor for the United States Championship. Triple H and Stone Cold Steve Austin versus Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens for the tag team titles. Daniel Bryan versus The Undertaker. And Shawn Michaels versus The Ultimate Warrior for the WWE Championship. So now I ask you, do you have any interest in these matches for a WrestleMania? And if this was an actual WrestleMania show, how well do you think it would hold up? The second part of that question is kind of hard to answer because we've seen stacked cards before for WrestleMania and other pay-per-views, and they've fallen flat. So just because it looks good on paper does not mean necessarily it's going to be a great show. Or vice versa, we've gotten pretty lackluster cards before for pay-per-views, and they've over-delivered in being great shows, mostly because our expectations are low, but... Nevertheless, based off the card you just listed, I think that's a really solid card. I mean, it's pretty random. I mean, not really. I mean, a lot of these matches would be just fucking cool. And it's a mix of g different generations and whatnot. So, assuming everyone that you mentioned is in their prime, uh, like a Stephanie Noska match would not be an in-ring mat classic. But it could be very entertaining with Asuka beating the shit out of Stephanie McMahon. <clears throat> Enzo and Big Cass are pretty much the New Age Outlaws. or were the New Age Outlaws of... 2016 2017 of the modern age so putting those teams up against each other would be pretty cool lesnar and balor is a match i've wanted to see for a while just to see how it would play out so doing that for the u.s that would be interesting zayn and owens as a tag team would be pretty cool i know we talked about that here on the show a while ago versus you know the two-man power trip of all people would be pretty damn cool uh, michaels and warrior i'm not sure if they ever had a match before Warrior left the company on multiple occasions. I'm not sure if they ever had a one-on-one -on -one match. I wouldn't be surprised if they did not Warrior squashed Michaels in a matter of seconds. And obviously that was before Michaels uh, became the main event guy that he later became in 96. But uh, Michaels of like, you know, uh, of his main event status versus Ultimate Warrior, I think could be pretty cool. I think Michaels could get a great match out of him. So, And then Bryan versus The Undertaker would also be really, really good. So... Um, I have interest in pretty much all those matches. And a Tommy and Joe as, like, the opener would be fucking amazing for a WrestleMania. Those two could just beat the living shit out of each other for the IC title. So, um, yeah, no, I think that WrestleMania looks damn good on paper. I would certainly buy it, and I think it would hold up pretty well, in my opinion. Captain Sunshine from YouTube. Why is it that The Miz keeps cutting promos on what's wrong with the baby faces? His promo on Enzo Moria was practically like a father chewing out his son about what he's doing with his life, and Enzo didn't really pull any good comebacks. The Miz is fucking great. The Miz and his mic skills are awesome, and I thought that promo was easily the highlight of the show. And why would you... I mean, like you said, they're having Miz, like, chew out the baby faces, but the guy's right every single time, whether it's Jason Jordan, whether it's John Cena, Roman Reigns, and now Enzo Amore. He's going after all the people. I mean, again, it would be one thing, like, he chewed out Daniel Bryan... Uh, you know, for doing, you know, he was truthful in his ass verbal assault on Daniel Bryan when they were feuding last year, but it's not like people were rooting for The Miz then. He was a hated heel. 
it's just because he's going up against people, the baby faces, that kind of had flaws. I mean, like, Jason Jordan has no charisma, which Miz mentioned, and he was absolutely right. With Cena and Reigns, and they had their moment, I want my moment. Again, completely correct. And now with Enzo, chewing out the most despised baby face right now in the, in the locker room in WWE. Maybe not with the fans, at least not yet. And then Enzo tried to, like, battle back and get some comebacks, like you said, but the crowd didn't even really care because they weren't good comebacks. So um, I'm, I'm loving The Miz right now, and I think the best heels have an element of truth to what they're saying. Um, I mean, it doesn't help that Enzo's... I mean, when you really think about it, why wouldn't Miz chew out Enzo? The guy cheats, and he's a fucking asshole backstage, apparently. Why wouldn't he chew him out? You know, that makes the most sense to me. As The, the promo made sense to me, personally. So I really had no issue with it, but they just need to book Enzo better. The guy's just an annoying-ass babyface, and he has been for a while, but without big cast there, those weaknesses are really exposed tenfold so uh yeah i mean the miz i think having him putting him in this spot where he's exposing the baby faces for all their flaws i think is a fine use of him because he's absolutely right in all the things that he's saying about these guys from jordan to enzo to cena to reigns they just got to book their baby faces better that's all their second question for a moment i thought dean ambrose and seth rollins were going to bring in dean malenko and jimmy noble out of retirement for the eight-man tag team main event and got legitimately excited. Tell me you would not be interested in apparently a three-foot-tall old man Dean Malenko butterfly suplexing Cesaro and Texas cloverleafing him. It'd be like a Chikara World of Sport appearance, but on WWE. That would have been pretty cool. I was getting a little excited there for a second. I knew they weren't going to do it. They were just kind of teasing it. Um, they, that probably would have been J&G security if Joey Mercury was still with the company. He's not. The bald guy who comes out, by the way, is not Joey Mercury. He looks a lot like him. That's Adam Pierce. Not all bald people look like people. Just saying. Uh, that's Adam Pierce. That's not Joey Mercury. You probably already knew that, but just clarifying. So Joey Mercury is gone. I thought they would do the whole J&J security thing, but he's not there anymore. But to answer your question, that would have been pretty cool. Noble and Malenko are fucking great. Both of them are very cool. So bringing them out of retirement to go up against uh, Sheamus and Cesaro in the club on Monday would have been damn cool. They didn't do it, but the Hardy Boys were fine too. Next question from, also I think Captain Sunshine, if the Cena Reigns promos are a work and completely scripted in advance, then how come Reigns' best lines are only, you fake little bitch, and you need WWE because you can't make it in Hollywood? The latter might have worked years ago when Cena wasn't being rumored for Knight Rider and DC Comics movies and his own, <clears throat> and his own cartoon and a new human character for the Transformer movies. Yeah, they're not giving Reigns these <laughs> too good of lines at all. I think they're giving them the blueprint for what they want them to say. I don't know if it's 100% scripted, but I think it's mostly scripted. But they're not giving Reigns any material, any good material at all. Like you said on Monday, a lot of what he said just isn't fucking true. The fact that, oh, you can't make it in Hollywood. I mean, John Cena's no rock, but the guy has clearly made it in Hollywood where he's being offered all these big roles, as you said, even now more than ever. You know, I'm not just talking about daddy's home or uh, sisterhood or whatever, sisters. He's being given pretty good roles now in movies and other than like train wreck and stuff. He's moving up in the world, so I commend Cena for that. But yeah, Reigns' line about him not making it in Hollywood just made no sense. And also when he said, oh, people aren't paying to see you anymore. You haven't sold tickets in five years. Dude, John Cena still sells more tickets than anyone on the fucking roster, other than Brock Lesnar. So when Cena said he was a way better part-timer than Roman Reigns as a full-timer a few weeks back, it was a, a sick burn because it's fucking true. So again, they're not giving Reigns these the best lines. I'm not sure if that's intentional or not to give Cena the upper hand in these promos because he has won every single verbal exchange they've had up to this point over the last three weeks. So, Reigns has got to get the upper hand at some point. I'm not sure how he will, but when you go one-on-one -on -one with Cena on the mic, Cena is 95% of the time going to get the upper hand, unless your name is like CM Punk or something. It just, I don't know why they're giving Reigns all this fucking awful material. That's, it's not bad, like his delivery is fine. The guy's not the best mic worker in the in the business anyway. But they, they got to realize that in giving him these lines that just aren't true, it's not increasing his chances of people looking at him as a legit threat to Cena. And if he loses, it's even worse. But if they're doing this just to set him up to win a No Mercy, that's fine. But you're right. Just a lot of the stuff they're having Reigns say about Cena just isn't true. So, therefore, it doesn't, it doesn't really pack a punch. 
Elena the Y from YouTube. So Jinder Mahal has been WWE champion for over 111 days now. I did some research and the closest guy who nearly made it to even a combined 100 days was Chris Jericho. Jinder Mahal has been WWE champion longer than Jericho, Big Show, Dean Ambrose, Daniel Bryan, Mick Foley, Jeff Hardy, Matista ever were, among others. His Has his reign been better than the others? Yeah, I mean, all the reigns you just mentioned, the guys held the fucking bell for how many how many days? You know what I mean? Like, Big Show held the championship for, what, a month? Before dropping it in Armageddon back in 2002? Or in 1999 for a month and a half? Daniel Bryan never really got a real run. Mick Foley never got a real run. Jeff Hardy had the belt for maybe a month, you know, here and there. Batiste, the same thing. So, I mean, obviously, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Jinder Mahal's been a dub better WWE champion than them. But when you consider how they were booked and how long they held the championship, of course he's going to be a better champion than them. I'm still going to say I'm not all that interested in his title reign. I know they've had him beat Orton a few times, and now Shinsuke Nakamura, but all those matches fucking sucked, you know? I mean, I know he's held the championship for 100 days, but, you know, uh, quantity does not is not always better than quality when it comes to the number of days that he's been WWE champion. You can be champion for a fucking year and a half and not have any great matches, and that's not a shot at CM Punk. I thought CM Punk was a great WWE champion because he had a lot of great matches in the time that he was WWE champion, and had a character revolution. He wasn't cutting the same promos every week. Jinder, I can't say the same thing about him. I mean, the promos are the same thing every single week. His promo this week was the only thing that's been different about his promos, his mic skills recently. And that promo fucking sucked about the facial expressions of Shinsuke Nakamura and how goofy they are and this and that. It was awful. And the matches aren't any better. So, I mean, yeah, sure, he's been a better... He's had a longer and better reign than those other guys you mentioned, but... It's not really saying much. It sounds more impressive on paper than it really is when you think about it. Uh, their next question. I've been reflecting on Intercontinental Championship matches on WrestleMania, and I think the last classic IC title match we got was the Razor Shawn Ladder match at WrestleMania 10. We've had some decent matches since then, but nothing on the level of Steamboat Savage or Hart and Piper from those first 10 WrestleManias. The IC title has gone through periods of rehabilitation over the past couple of years, but one thing it's still missing is the modern era, or in the modern era, is a proper big-time WrestleMania match. What's one IC match that could recapture that label for WrestleMania 34? You know, that's a great observation, and you are absolutely right, because I think for, not 15 years, oh, man, what was it that, um... I don't remember. I think there was a pretty lengthy period of time where the IC championship either wasn't defended at WrestleMania. Yeah, from WrestleMania 18, when I think RVD beat Regal, up until WrestleMania 25, for seven years, the belt wasn't even defended on WrestleMania, which is ridiculous. And yeah, in recent years, we've had ladder matches, which are great, but like you said, they're not classic. Like, the 32 ladder match was completely unnecessary. That match, the the classic IC title match, could have been Kevin Owens versus Sami Zayn. It could have been that at WrestleMania 32, but they just had to throw fucking Stardust in there, and, and Sin Cara, and Zack Ryder, who won, which was cool, and the match was really good. But the match, people overrate the match. One of the best ten mat, top ten matches of 2016. It was not. It was a great ladder match. It was a great spot fest. But it wasn't that great of a match. The build was terrible. And 31, same thing. The match was really, really good. But throwing a bunch of great wrestlers in a ladder match just for the sake of having a ladder match at WrestleMania doesn't mean it's a great match. Doesn't mean it's a classic IC title match. So I completely agree. No other IC title match in the past 20 years comes to mind. But um, if you're asking me what match they could do at WrestleMania 34 that could recapture that, that could be a classic IC Championship match. I mean, I was looking at the Raw roster because the IC title is on Raw. I mean, Miz versus Jason Jordan, unless they build up Jason Jordan really, really well in the next four or five months, it's it's not going to be a classic match. Um, I mean, it, it's hard to say with who they have available to them, but I will say, Miz being the IC Champion through WrestleMania has got, it, it's got to be what happens. I mean, the guy is most associated with that championship, more associated with that belt than anyone else in the past 10 years, I would say. He's had that good of reigns as IC champion, um, especially the last two or three times he's held the championship. So I would keep the belt on Miz through WrestleMania. I think you, I mean, I know he's not the greatest wrestler in the world, but the guy's had great matches for the championship with guys like Dean Ambrose and Dolph Ziggler and a few others. So it is possible to have a great classic IC title match at WrestleMania with the Miz. The issue is who you put him up against. Roman Reigns versus Miz would be a big match. I'm not sure many people want to see Reigns as IC champion after the flop of a reign he had with the U.S. Championship. 
Um, but that could be a really good match. Miz and Rollins, I don't know what they're going to be doing with him by WrestleMania. That would be a big-time match for the IC Championship. That could be really, really good. Miz versus Finn Balor, we've seen that before on Raw. They have good chemistry. And Balor has re really yet to go after a championship since coming back from injury. So depending on what they're doing with Balor by WrestleMania time, Balor and Miz with Balor winning the belt would be pretty cool. So I don't think they're going to be Hart and Piper or Steamboat Savage or Shawn Michaels versus Razor. Um, but Miz versus any one of those three guys could be really, really good in a big-time match for WrestleMania. I mean, I thought Corbin and Ambrose's match at WrestleMania this year was kind of disappointing, which was, you know, maybe partly because they were on the kickoff show and they didn't care or they just didn't have enough time, whatever. I mean, Ambrose is a former world champion. It was a fine match, but, I mean, I, I appreciate that we didn't get a, a multi-man ladder match at WrestleMania this year for the first time in a few years, but they got to do more with the belt that doesn't involve them you know, uh, doing fucking multi-man matches. They got to give us a classic one-on-one -on -one feud, which could have been Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, but they didn't do they didn't do that. They didn't go that route, so whatever. Brandon A's got a couple questions here from YouTube. Um, obviously, most of us do not want SmackDown to go three hours. With the roster so huge, though, how can then we can how then can we explain how about certain superstars not appearing on SmackDown from week to week? Also, they barely even book the superstars they do showcase right away anyway. Thoughts? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? You know, dude, I was thinking about this the other day. I'm not saying SmackDown needs to go three hours. It might be because they've added more people to the roster compared to a year ago. And people are complaining, oh, SmackDown has such a small roster when, you know, coming out of the brand split. It's like, yeah, Raw has a bigger roster because it's three hours. And they were in the middle of rehabbing certain wrestlers and bringing people back from injury last year. But they more than made the most of the roster they had. Like, you would see people like Baron Corbin, Apollo Crews, Jack Swagger, The Miz, Dolph Ziggler, Kalisto on the show every single week. Nowadays, you barely get... I mean, Dillinger's been in more matches recently than he has ever been on SmackDown. But um, beyond Dillinger, Sami Zayn is barely on the show. Luke Harper... Mike Kanellis, Bobby Roode has not wrestled for the past two weeks. You know, they don't use everyone they have, at least not as well as they once did. Um, Ziggler was off TV for like two or three months because they had no idea what to do with him. He did not even show up on television. So with guys like Dolph Ziggler and, you know, Luke Harper and Mike Bennett, Mike Kanellis, whatever, not that they need to go three hours because I was thinking about that same thing last night. Like, what do you do? And it's not that anyone's being overexposed. It's not like Jinder's in three segments in one show. I know Kevin Owens was in a few segments last night, but the whole show centered around him and they needed to do that. But I, I think the smaller roster was the key to SmackDown utilizing all their guys properly, or at least more people getting television time on a consistent basis. Uh, so I don't know. I'm not sure where they're going with this, but um, I don't know you know I don't know where they're going with certain guys like Sami Zayn and, and Luke Harper who are never on TV to begin with. But it sucks because a lot of those guys are just never getting television time. And I know that's what the next your next question has to do with, so we'll get into it now. I, again, I don't know if they need to go three hours. They don't need to go three hours. That would be the fucking kiss of death of SmackDown. And the show's already declined in quality compared to earlier this year. But um, So going three hours would be the kiss of death. So I, I don't know what you do. I mean, they used to have shows like Main Event or Superstar. Thing. I think SmackDown had Main Event where that would be like kind of their secondary show to what Main Event is to Raw now when Superstars was property of Raw, and that would help showcase certain people, but, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not really sure. I don't know what they do, so, you know, going three hours would not be what I would do, but that's, that's a great question. I just do not have a proper answer for it. They just got to give more people time. They just got to showcase them from week to week and kind of book things out as opposed to week to week, but doing it uh, in advance, like knowing where they're going with certain people and certain angles in order to get them over, as opposed to doing fucking Sami Zayn versus Aiden English one week and then failing to follow up on the following week. You know what I mean? So, I don't know. Going three hours is not the answer. Let's not say that at all. Um, three hours of Raw is bad enough. Just a smaller roster. I know they throw all these people. They bring back, you know, Shelton Benjamin. They call up Bobby Roode without really getting rid of anybody. Um, so, I don't know what they need to do, but it is an issue. I will agree. So speaking of which, push repackage release, also from Brandon. Mike Canella, Sami Zayn, Luke Harper. This one was pretty easy. I would push Sami Zayn, the guy he deserves, a lot better than what he's getting right now. Repackage Luke Harper, I think they got to get rid of. If they gave him a new look or something, I think he could be a major star for them. Um, if he didn't look like a hobo, then I think he could be a lot bigger than what he is. 
And then release Mike Kanellis. I like Mike Kanellis, but you never said anything about Mike and Maria. So you could keep Maria and then get rid of Mike. So again, I like Mike Kanellis a lot. I think they're, they could be doing a lot more with him. A lot They could be using him a lot better than they have been. But he's nothing compared to Zane and Harper. So again, push Zane, repackage Harper, release Kanellis. Mike Kanellis, that is. Keep or erase in history? This is a good question. WrestleMania 17, 19, 30, and 31, but also you have to keep 9 and 11. WrestleMania is 9 and 11. Or SummerSlam 2002, 2013, 2008, NXT Brooklyn 1, but also you have to keep SummerSlam 2010, 07, and 95. Whew, this is tough. Um, The WrestleManias are more monumental, um, especially 17, but I'm going to have to say keep the SummerSlams. You know, I'm not a... I think you guys know, I think 17 is a great show. It's not my favorite. So personally, I would get rid of the WrestleManias. I mean, 19 was a good show. It was by far one of the best. Um, I thought 30 and 31 were awesome. But um, I would get rid of those just to keep... I mean, 9 and 11, WrestleManias 9 and 11 are absolutely fucking atrocious. Those WrestleManias suck. So you combine that with the fact that I'm not a huge 17 fan to begin with. or not, I mean, I like 19 a lot, but it's not among my favorites. And I like 30 and 31, but you also have to keep 9 and 11, the two worst WrestleManias in my opinion. I'll pass. 02 SummerSlam, 2013, 08, and NXT Brooklyn 1 were fucking phenomenal shows, all four of them. So I would keep those. And then, keeping SummerSlams 2010, 07, and 95, yeah, 2010 and, and 07 aren't that bad. 95 is pretty terrible. But I would keep 95. I mean, at least 95 is Razor and Michaels. 2010 and 07, they're not too... I mean, they're pretty boring. They're not great shows. They're pretty deplorable, but they're not nearly as bad as WrestleMania's 9 and 11. So that, to me, is a pretty easy answer as well. A good question, but with an easy answer. I would keep SummerSlams 02, uh, 2013, 08, and NXT Brooklyn 1, as well as SummerSlams 2010, 07, and 95, in a race, WrestleMania 17, 19, 30, 31, and then 9 and 11. And if WrestleMania 17 never happens... Does that mean that Stone Cold never goes heel? You know, think about that for a second. Jeremy B. from Facebook. With it looking like they're finally starting to integrate more cruiserweights with the real roster, uh, what are some matches and feuds you would like to see? That's a good question, too. Um, I was thinking about this last night. I mean, really anyone. I mean, putting anyone on the show would be a breath of fresh air for 205 Live. Fucking Brazongo showed up last night, and it was one of the more entertaining things I've ever seen on 205 Live in quite some time. So, really anybody, but... Realistically speaking, I mean, there really aren't many dream feuds. Like, I would have said Miz and Austin Aries when he was around, but obviously Austin Aries is gone now. Um, one match or a feud I would like to see. I know we saw a bit of it last year, but we never saw a full-fledged feud. Seth Rollins versus Neville. in With Rollins as the babyface and Neville as the heel. That could be very entertaining. All their matches last year were fucking great. And going back to that, especially... Or not last year, I'm sorry, two years ago. So going back to that and doing, um, you know, with Neville as the heel this time around and how hot he's been recently, that could be really, really good. Not only as a one-off match, but as a full-fledged feud, I think would be great. Um, also, not really a match, but I want to see Apollo Crews and Akira Tozawa become a more regular team. They're not even really a team. They've never tag teamed once in WWE, but they're still a part of the same, the same stable. So I would put Crews and Tozawa in a tag team. Tozawa's days in the Cruiserweight Championship picture are done anyway. So he might as well do something else with him. He's been spinning his wheels ever since he dropped the championship to Neville and lost his rematch. So I would pair him up with Apollo Crews. They're best friends anyway. They work well together. They have good chemistry in Titus Worldwide. Uh, or uh, is it Titus Worldwide? Or it, the Titus brand or Titus Worldwide? I think it's Titus Worldwide now. But yeah, I would do Apollo Crews and Tozawa as a tag team. Then, you know, put them in the division. I mean, they're better than Slater and Rhino, who we talked about last week. Who WWE's not doing anything with right now. So... And they can be pretty popular. And, and it also gives Apollo Crews something to do, too. So, yeah, I would put Apollo Crews and Tozawa together as a tag team. And then as a feud, like I said, Rollins and Neville, I think, would be killer. At Lily Reynolds from Twitter, their question was, should Finn Balor move over to SmackDown Live? I think he should. Um, Yeah, I wouldn't be opposed to it. I mean, he's, he's not doing much on Raw. When he first came back, they did nothing with the guy for many months. And now he finally has a feud, but it's with fucking Bray Wyatt. Like, there's people for him to face on Raw. Like, he can feud with John Cena, Roman Reigns, The Miz, like I talked about, Samoa Joe again, if you want to go down that route. There are Braun Strowman down the road, if you want to do that too, Brock Lesnar. There's a lot of fresh opponents for him on Raw, and 
Bray Wyatt's a fresh view too, but they just don't have any chemistry. So I think overnight Finn Balor would become a world championship contender. I think he could beat Jinder Mahal in day one to become the new WWE champion. So yeah, with Balor, I think him moving him moving over to SmackDown right now I think would be good for him, but keeping him on Raw isn't bad. It's just that I don't think he's ever going to become a main event guy or at least win a world championship as long as Brock Lesnar is on the show and is world champion. He just won't get a shot, or at least not win it anyway. He might get a shot against Brock at like a later pay-per-view or something, but he won't win. So, yeah, I mean, I think Balor moving over to SmackDown maybe in exchange for a Baron Corbin or a Bobby Roode or a Sami Zayn or something could be uh, good for Balor. So, I would, yeah, I would agree. Maybe not right now. It's not mandatory, but... He isn't really being utilized to his best, you know, to his uh, full potential right now on Raw because he's really been relegated to the mid-card, so to speak, since coming back from injury, which I think he deserves better. At E13A, would you pay to see this? Uh, it was a picture of a card with, like, doink matches at the Doinkatorium and all this other shit. I'm pretty sure it's obviously fake, but it was a bunch of matches with people called Doink the Clown. Doink the Clown, obviously, and they were all facing each other in various matches. No, I would not pay to see that even a dollar. to pay. I would not even go see that for free. That sounds awful. What I would pay to see is It. And I did not pay to see it because I work at a movie theater and it's I, I went to go see it for free. But it's a great movie. Um, and that, It's kind of unrelated, but not really. They're both about clowns. So that's why I bring it up. It was a very, very good movie. Uh, check out Jason's review of the movie on his channel at Blue Eyed Disorder right here on YouTube. But uh, cheap plug. It was great, so I would not pay to see that. I would not even go see it for free, but it you should pay your money to go see. It is a very, very good horror movie, and I'm not even a big horror movie guy. At Nick the Hulk 43 from Twitter. Now, Nick, speaking of work, uh, this is one of my work buddies. He's a great guy. Definitely check out his stuff. He's awesome. Follow him on the Twitter machine, at Nick the Hulk 43 Nick is awesome. His question was, and I laughed when I saw this, why were John Cena and that one arm tattoo dude so good at acting? And he said he forgot his name. I wanted to see them fight after watching that. So I guess Nick tuned in to Raw this past week. That would be Roman Reigns, my friend. Um, but like I talked about earlier, the promos that Cena and Reigns have had over the past three weeks have been fucking great. I still say the best one was the first one, the contract signing they had. But uh, the last two have not been bad either. And Cena just continues to bury this guy every single fucking week. Cena cannot be touched on the microphone. He is one of, if not the best mic guy in the entire company right now. And he has been for a long time, but it's more evident now than ever before with guys like Punk on and whatever. But um, he is so fucking good. And it's because they're incorporating real life into their promos. I mean, again, a lot of the stuff that Reigns was saying wasn't true. But And I wrote about this in an article for Bleach Report two weeks ago. That incorporating more realism into the Roman Reigns character is going to be what gets him over. Um, not beating people or being booked to look like an underdog or all, any of that other shit. It's because he's being more real, he, you know, more real reality based. I guess uh, it's a tongue twister, but as opposed to being larger than life, which is what he looks like, and he looks like a superhero, as does John Cena. But when they're talking about all this, you know, not fake stuff, but I don't know when they when they incorporate real life tension, which I'm sure there is, you know, a sense of tension there. I'm sure they don't hate each other the same way that Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart did back in the day. But I'm sure there is some underlying sense of tension between the two, an underlying layer of heat, so to speak, uh, between the two guys. And you kind of turn that up to an 11, and it makes for great segments. It makes for must-see television. So. And yeah, I wanted to see them fight after that too. I think their last few segments on SmackDown, or not SmackDown, but their last few segments on Raw uh, since the whole feud started have been stellar. And it's made me want to see them fight. I'm not sure how the good how good the match is going to be. I'm sure it won't be a five-star Matt Classic, but it could be a modern-day Rock and Hogan where the crowd reception is so crazy that it doesn't even really matter what in ring, you know, what they produce in the ring. It doesn't have to be, you know, a technical wrestling masterpiece. But if they capture that crowd like they have the past couple weeks with these promo exchanges, then it's going to be a classic match. And the whole point of these promos for guys like Nick is not a regular wrestling fan in the slightest, but if they see that, and it makes them want to see, the, it makes that person want to see those two people fight, like a John Cena and a Roman Reigns, that's the whole point of the promos. It's in the word, promos, to uh, promote their upcoming match for a pay-per-view. And they did that, they sold me on it, and I'm glad to hear they don't. They not only sold me on that match in No Mercy, 
but also non-viewers as well, or at least not hardcore of fans, as like me and you and whatever. At RJ underscore Marceau, this question is, uh, let's see here, is WWE building Braun Strowman up just to lose to Brock and No Mercy? Yeah, they are. Um, I don't see Braun winning. I wish he would. And RJ said this before, he wanted him to win at WrestleMania, and he lost. He wanted him to win at SummerSlam, he lost. I doubt it's going to be third time's the charm, but, um, I mean, it's great. They had Braun beat all these other people, and they gave him a strong showing at SummerSlam. I don't think they're going to deter from their plans to have Brock face Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. I just don't think they will. Um, I think they should, but they won't. So, And the thing is, is that they have Braun lose, and then what's next? Like, Samoa Joe lost to, to Brock Lesnar a few months ago. And the guy's not even on Raw. Now, I know he's hurt, but I highly, highly, highly doubt that they had any mega plans for him on, on Raw after uh, SummerSlam. It, you know, John Cena and Roman Reigns were already locked up, and then you already have, you know, Brock and Braun going at it the next pay-per-view. So what would Samoa Joe have done, you know, if he was not injured right now? And I fear the same thing's going to happen to Braun Strowman. Not to say that he's going to be off the next pay-per-view at TLC in October, but just, I don't know what else you do with him. What else do you do with Braun Strowman? Does he go back to facing Roman Reigns? Does he do a feud with John Cena in the fall? Like, I'm not sure what you do with Braun after he very likely loses to Brock and No Mercy. So, yeah, they are building him up. They are giving him all this offense on Brock, which is great just to have him lose. I wish they wouldn't, but they are, and it sucks. Thoughts on Asuka on Raw? Uh, RJ's second question was, I think it's for the better. I think SmackDown's okay. Um, I know right now it kind of revolves around Naomi and Natalia and Carmella. I think SmackDown's going to be okay. And they're not even utilizing Becky or Charlotte. And Lana and, and fucking Tamina are terrible. But at least Becky and Charlotte are the two best they have. And they're not even on TV week to week. And they're back at TV. You know, Charlotte's, you know, she was out for a while due to Ric Flair being in the hospital. But she's been back for a while now. They're just not using her. So, again, I think SmackDown's okay. Uh, Raw could use her. I mean, again, they have Emma, but they're fucking burying her right now. Uh, they just, she just is a complete loser. Bailey's out hurt. Sasha Banks is kind of struggling as a babyface, and they have Alexa. So, I think Asuka and Alexa Bliss could be a great feed for the championship in the fall. But, yeah, I think Asuka on Raw is it's what's best. And I, I know people are worried about them potentially ruining Asuka, and there's a bigger chance of that happening on Raw compared to SmackDown. But, uh... The women's division on Raw needs her more than SmackDown's does. Uh, at V4 Volkner, his question was also from Twitter, do you agree with the decision to let Baszler go all the way to the finals instead of Maya Yim or Candice LeRae in the Mae Young Classic? Yeah, I mean, Mae Young, or May, <laughs> God rest your soul, Mae Young came back and wrestled in the finals of her own tournament. But uh, Mae Young, or uh, excuse me, Maya, I see the M-Y here, and that's why I think Mae Young. Maya Yim, excuse me, or Candice LeRae being in the finals with uh, Kyrie Zane could have made for a better match. I'm not denying that at all. Uh, the Baszler match last night was real good. I thought it was a really, really good match. It wasn't great, and there were better matches in the tournament. So putting Tony Storm in there or Maya Yim or LeRae could have been a better match, but they aren't as big of names as Baszler. She, they're not as notable as Baszler, and they wanted the whole... They wanted, Ronda, they wanted Ronda Rousey there, and they wanted the media attention, so... That's why they did it. Baszler didn't win. It's not that big of a deal. You know, Kyrie Zane won as she was supposed to anyway. And I think there was a bigger chance, honestly. Again, <clears throat> like if they put Maya Yim or LeRae in there, it was obvious that Zane was winning. I mean, Kyrie Zane should have won anyway. Or Kyrie Zane, excuse me, not Zane. That's that's Sami Zane. But uh, Kyrie Zane should have won anyway. But if they put Yim or LeRae in there, it would have been even more predictable. At least when they put Baszler in there, there was a chance that she could have won the, the crown, that she could have won the tournament. So, um, yeah, no, I thought what they did was really, really good. I thought uh, they did a great job with the finals. I thought the match was real good, and I, I can't say I disagree with the final decision of having Zayn, or Zayn, excuse me, beat Baszler, as opposed to having Yim or LeRae in there, which could have been a better match, but hopefully they get signed anyway, and they face Kyrie Sain in NXT. Which Mae Young Classic matches were your highlight? I assume you mean my favorite. Um... The finals were good. Like I said, a lot of the first round main events I thought were fucking awesome. Piper Niven versus Santana Garrett was great. Tessa Blanchard versus Kyrie Zane. Uh, Kyrie Zane versus. What was the other one she had? Bianca Belair was really, really good. That was a great match. Kyrie Zane versus Tony Storm was really good. 
Tony Storm versus Piper Niven. There were there were a lot of really really good matches. More so the main events, um, but there were a lot of good matches. Amaya Yim versus Sarah Logan in the first round. So yeah, those were some of my favorite matches from the Mae Young Classic. Next question: Your thoughts on the current Dolph Ziggler character and where it will lead to? I don't care. I mean, how many times have we gone over this with the Dolph Ziggler character? How many times do I have to say I just do not give two shits about the fucking Dolph Ziggler character? And he said it last night, oh, I'm a good wrestler. It's like, dude, you've been a good wrestler for 10 years, but you've been the same mid-card competitor you've been for the past 20 fucking years. 20 years. I mean, 10 years. I mean, it might as well be 20. It feels like 20. I mean, the whole mocking gimmick and the impersonations, it's like, holy shit, I don't fucking care. It doesn't mean anything, you know? So... I don't know where it's going. I honestly don't even really care. I just, I want to tune out every time I see one of any anytime I see any one of his segments, because they're just they don't serve any purpose. I feel like I'm wasting my time watching his segments on SmackDown because they're not going anywhere. They're not leading anywhere. Him impersonating wrestlers to what? I mean, him facing Bobby Roode is probably where this is headed to a feud between those two heading into Hell in a Cell next month. But beyond that, who the fuck could he possibly feud with? Like. Who cares? You know, I, I don't know. I'm not feeling it. I'm not digging it. I don't know where it's going, and I don't really care. Other than a possible feud with, uh, like I said, a possible program with uh, Bobby Roode. At Scarlet One, final three questions of the show here today. Should Kyrie Sane be the next NXT Women's Champion? So, if you missed it, Sane is getting a title shot at the next TakeOver special in Houston, I believe, So, which is pretty cool. It's unknown who her opponent's going to be. But I assume they're going to do something. I, I, I kind of figured they would have the winner of the Mae Young Classic face, you know, a winner of a battle royal or a mini tournament in the next day. I assume it's going to be Ember Moon. Um, but yeah, Kyrie Zane with Asuka on the main roster is the best they have. The best women's wrestler they have. Ember Moon is great too. I mean, I guess they could have Ember Moon win it after losing the first two times. But I would keep seeing unbeaten and have her win the championship so yeah i think she should be the next nxt women's champion i think she's a fine replacement for asuka and having them go at it on the main roster would be money one day how do you feel about jack gallagher jack gallagher's heel turn on 205 live um like i said in my review earlier this morning it's interesting um i'm not sure if i'm sold on it yet just because gallagher was one of the more popular baby faces they had in the cruiserweight division but it is interesting. It got people talking. There were a lot of people talking about it last night, which is rare for 205 Live. No one ever talks about it on Twitter these days, if they ever did to begin with, other than maybe the debut of the show or the launch of the program. But um, people were talking about it. It got people talking. Um, it's a nice, refreshing change for his character. Again, I think he works better as a babyface, but we'll see where this leads. Maybe he becomes more aggressive and him and Kendrick are a tag team. I don't know where this is going, but they have my attention, so... Ask me again in a couple weeks after we see what they do with Gallagher and whether they just wasted a perfectly good baby face. Because right now, I'm not sure. But I think either way, whether it's a good move or a bad move, I'm invested. I will say that much. And that's rare to say about a 205 Live you know, storyline or an angle nowadays. Next question and the final question. What are some of the best and worst No Mercy matches? And does anything for this year, from this year's pay-per-view seem to be leaning towards either direction? Um, the best, and I did talk about this cheap plug in another article for Bleacher Report last weekend, uh, ranking every installment in No Mercy history from worst to best. Spoiler alert, uh, 2002 is number one. I thought No Mercy 02 was the best No Mercy pay-per-view ever. Um, so going off of that, some of the best No Mercy matches, in my opinion, even from last year, Dolph Ziggler versus The Miz, uh, AJ Styles versus John Cena and Dean Ambrose in the triple threat from last year's show. From 08, Jericho and Shawn Michaels for the World Heavyweight Championship in a ladder match. Brock Lesnar versus The Undertaker in the Hell in a Cell match for the WWE Championship from No Mercy 02. And the Jericho HBK match, I think, is it, it's from 08. I think I, I think I said that, but if I didn't, it's from 2008. Uh, and then from 2002, also, uh, Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit versus Edge and Rey Mysterio in the finals of the WWE Tag Team Title Tournament. And the Hardy Boys versus Edge and Christian from No Mercy 1999. That kind of kicked off their whole. You know, triangle feud of the Dudley Boys in the next few years. So, uh, those I would say, I mean, I'm sure there's others, but those to me are some of the best No Mercy matches. Uh, worst, William Regal and Naked Midian was fucking atrocious for as long as it lasted. I think back in 2000, I want to say. If not 01, I think it was 2000. Tory Wilson versus Don Marie. That match was for the US, uh, for the European Championship, by the way, between Regal and Midian. Uh, Tory Wilson and Don Marie from 2002. 
terrible as expected. No Mercy OT, like I said, is the best No Mercy show in my opinion all around. Doesn't mean it was flawless, and Wilson and Marie sucked. Uh, GBL and Undertaker, the last ride match from No Mercy 04 was not good, and the finish was even worse. Uh, and then CM Punk and Big Daddy V, for as long as it lasted from No Mercy 2007, that was terrible too. Uh, any matches from this year's show that could be good or bad? Uh, bad at worst No Mercy matches? I don't think so. There's not one, like, maybe Enzo shits the bed against Neville, then maybe, but I doubt it. I think Neville's going to get at least a passable match out of Enzo. Um, but other than that, I think for best, we could see Cena and Reigns added to that list if it's a classic match and there's no fucking bullshit finish or shenanigans. And Brock Lesnar and Braun Strowman, I mean, the match has been built up brilliantly over the past month or so, even really dating back to when they first clashed the night after WrestleMania uh, earlier this year. So the build's been great. They made Strowman look like a total beast. And it's not going to be a typical squash match with Braun Strowman getting his ass kicked by Brock Lesnar for 10 minutes or five minutes or whatever. It's going to be a real competitive fight. And if anything, Braun Strowman's probably going to get most of the offense, so, which is pretty cool. So um, that could be one of the best no mercy, mercy uh, excuse me, one of the best no mercy matches ever if they play their cards right. So I guess we'll have to wait and see. But that does it, guys, for episode 198 of Hashtag Ask you something here today for September 13th, 2017. Again, appreciate you guys tuning into the show. Be sure to like the video, drop a comment, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more daily content. And like I said earlier, guys, cannot stress it enough. Two weeks from today, September 27th at noon Eastern time, we are going live for the first time ever in the channel's history. For the first time in eight and a half years, we're going live on the channel to broadcast live for hashtag AskGSM episode 200. So if you want to send in a question, start right now for episode 200 with the hashtag AskGSM200 on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, whatever. Just be sure to indicate it's for that episode. But if not, you just want your question in next week's show, which is still pretty important too, don't get me wrong. Let's not underestimate that show either. But uh, you can leave a comment on this very video. I'll include it in next week's edition, your question. Uh, you can tweet me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with your question. I'll be sure to include that in next week's edition as well. As well as on Facebook at facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Drop a comment on the post. I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. So again, on Twitter, hashtag AskGSM, if not hashtag AskGSM200 for two weeks from now. Other than that, if you don't include the hashtag, I'll just include it for next week's episode. Or you could do both, one for next week and one for two weeks. So either way, I got some big plans for that show. Again, nothing too special, but we might have a few guests on over the phone for the first time ever. We might have a few uh, you know, live questions from the live chat. Whatever you guys are doing, again, Wednesday afternoon is kind of a busy time for people. So that's the only time I was available to do it, and I wanted to do it on that day. Uh, Wednesdays are probably the best day for me other than Thursday, so... Anyway, guys, and I work on weekends. So that being said, thank you for tuning into the show. As always, I appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your week, guys. I'm Graham G.S. Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.